Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath School this morning, where we will be studying our lesson called The Seal of God and Mark of the Beast, part one. So this will be uh, the first part of a two-part series. Uh, and you know we like to continue on. Um, even when there's not a two-part series, we want to continue going. But today we will jump into our lesson in a moment. Uh, but first, we will have a testimony from Sister Lindsay. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to share how the Lord was blessing us. We are on a um, family work trip right now. And before we left, my kids, um, just a few days before we left, they both seemed like they were feeling ill and mm -hmm. they had a miraculous recovery. And mm -hmm. um, I just praise God that they maintained their health through this trip. And also before we had left, I had tried to connect with um, some Avenists that were here in the area. You know, something that's great about being Avenists is that we have this great community. So um, I had attempted to reach out to friends and people on Facebook that were, you know, in the church in this local area. And um, I came up dry. <laughs> Apparently, nobody goes further north than we are. Everyone is south of mm -hmm. where we live. But um, actually, while we, when we were pulling into the, the Metroplex, I happened to see one of my friends on Facebook was saying that they were excited to be at this location for this graduation. And I actually met and I got to see a friend from college, which was from years ago um, that I haven't seen since and we haven't been in contact but she happened to be here in town visiting a friend that I didn't even know they knew each other they didn't know each other when we knew each other but now they know each other and she you know the other girl she was teaching in Korea actually when I was in Korea I again you know 11 12 <laughs> years ago even you know you know it just seems like it's so random. And yet mm -hmm. I just felt like it was such a blessing to be able to um, be able to see them after all this time. And so again, the expectations and the things that we try and um, put together are always not as, as uh, amazing as the things that God um, puts mm -hmm. together in our lives. So. I love it when he, um, takes what we think is a disappointment. It's like, no, I needed you not to do that because you needed to be free for this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And then you see what the, the blessing is. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. Mm -hmm. But we get frustrated when we get the no or we get the disappointment. And we're like, just why couldn't this work out? It was so perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. like, well, I have even more perfect for you. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely a blessing. So with this, do we have any other praise reports or prayer requests that we want to put out there? I just praise God that he's getting me through the week or he got me through the week. Um, it was a little bit of a rough week um, with work, but um, I praise God that he got me through. So, yeah. I praise God that this week was better than last week because last week was a rough week. This week was better. Mm -hmm. And I want to pray for um, a childhood friend of my husband's. Um, his son just passed recently. He was just 15 years old. Wow. So um, I'm going to pray for their family. Mm -hmm. Definitely do that. All right. So I'm going to pray for all of the um, the people affected by those, all the smoke. Oh, yeah. Especially in the Northeast. Um, it's hard when you have people who already have respiratory issues and they have no choice. It's like, you can't get away from it. Yeah. Um, so definitely pray for that and the fires and that all this subsides soon. Yeah. Yeah. It was really bad on Wednesday. Yes. You oh. know, and it's interesting. I'm from the West coast and I always say, you know, we have a lot of fires on the West coast, but the East coast never gets them. And here and we are. Yep. Here we are. Look, you never know. <laughs> All right. So we will ask Sister Naomi to pray for our prayer requests and then to open Sabbath school. Yes. 
Um, dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much that we can come together and study your word and read your inspired word. Um, I am lifting up the prayer requests that were mentioned here. Um, the family who has lost a um, child and um, for those who have been affected by the fires, either by just smelling the smoke or literally by the fires affecting their homes or anything else. Um, I lift these up to you and I um, pray for your wisdom and guidance and um, safety for all of these people. I also pray um, for the Sabbath school lesson and us as we study. Please um, send your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and guidance through. And I pray that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned earlier, today's lesson is the seal of God and mark of the beast part one. So we know that we have um, been talking a lot about revelation and end times and the three angels message. So this will take us into what is the seal of God and the mark of the beast? And I think we're going to dig deeper into that um, this week and next week, but we'll start with um, how some of this, the prophecies we've already studied, when you look at the beast power in 13 and the little horn in Revelation 7 and the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2, they all speak of a power that usurps God's authority, commands loyalty, and introduces a counterfeit system of worship. So I think those three points are good to remember as we go through this. So I'll, I'll say them again. This power usurps God's authority, commands loyalty, and is a counterfeit system of worship. Um, that's like on one side, but then on the other side, we were, I know we talked about uh, maybe two weeks ago, the difference between, um, oh, it was actually, yeah, it was two weeks ago. It was the woman, the two women um, in Revelation, I think it was six, where one is, is clothed in scarlet and mm -hmm. the other hat is clothed in light. Um, and one is represents the truth and one represents untruth um but they're opposite the scarlet and purple is the untruth the white is the truth and purity <laughs> just to keep that straight but this is the same way so you have that power that is counterfeit it's not what is god's power and then you have in contrast i love that is a great motivating made a great motivating force and that is the kingdom of god where that love power is all so we're going to look a little bit closer at that. And let's start with reading Revelation 14, 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay, so what are the two characteristics that we discover in this this part about the, the last day people. They have the faith of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. So they keep the commandments and they have the faith of Jesus or keep the testimony, which is the commandments. Why is one just as important as the other? Why is it both that are in this verse? Can you do one without the other? Maybe not, but I do think they're separate, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I feel like they're two separate things because I mean, it's one thing is keeping the commandments and one thing is the faith of Jesus. But when you, could you be an end time person without both? Is that, that's that's no. more of a question. No, you couldn't. And why? Why are they both important when it comes to the end times? Well, I think we have to remember that to keep the commandments, we need to have the faith of Christ to keep mm -hmm. the commandments. So mm -hmm. I think that the faith of Jesus Christ is imperative for one, but I wouldn't say that I don't I don't know that it goes the other way. But I mean I think both are um uh taken seriously at the end. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna add like going towards in the end times, um, as you mentioned, um, loyalty, authority, and worship, we have to um, 
have the faith of Jesus to keep the commandments because we will be using it when we are in the opposition and fierce persecution specifically, when we are being tested to go against God and not be loyal to him and not keep his commandments. So they both need to happen to stand strong against persecution. And is that why the first part of that says, here's the patient or the endurance of the saints? Oh, yeah. mm. <laughs> very important, very important. <laughs> I mean, what? why do you think today is calling for us to endure? And you kind of touched on that a little bit, Naomi. Yeah, it won't be easy. Mm -hmm. It will not be easy. They will not make it easy to just stand with God. Um, at least Satan won't make it easy through these people, whatever have you. Yeah, I think it always sounds strange to me, but I believe that it's actually a word, stick to itiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think we just, we want to be strong when the going is really tough. We want to be extra strong. We're going to be strong, but really I think God is calling his people to be consistent, mm -hmm. to be steady, to keep going, even after you fall down, mm -hmm. to keep, to keep going. And, um, I think that's what the, the patience of the saint, not that we're just waiting for him to come back, but that we are every day mm -hmm. enduring that we're following him and after everything. And I think one thing with that stick to itiveness, if you think about um, like the Grand Canyon, for example, or you think about any like divot in a rock that starts with just a drip mm -hmm. and it just keeps dripping and that consistent drip carves into rock mm -hmm. because it's so consistent. And actually I saw something early, um, that someone sent me earlier this week and it talked about what caused them to be successful. And they said, it's just staying sticking with it picking the thing and sticking with it and it's nothing i've done extraordinary it's nothing i've done over and beyond it's staying taking that road and staying on that road and if i have to reinvent a thing yes i'm going to still stay on that road so it is that that mm -hmm. consistency that makes anyone great mm -hmm. i mean even if you're playing a sport you don't become great the first time you pick up a basketball mm -hmm. It's the people who are sitting there and missing all of these shots, but they still, they, they keep trying, they keep trying, they keep trying. Mm -hmm. sure. So let's also look at um, Romans 8, 1 through 4, and then Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And we'll start with Romans 8, 1 through 4. Are you getting the Romans one? And I'll get the Ephesians. Okay. Okay. Um, Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay. And then Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Oh, she may have frozen there. I can find it really quick. Okay, it's Ephesians 2. I have it right here. Oh, there you are. You're back? Okay. I was always here, but I don't know that you were there. So okay. um, if you want to read now, that'll be perfect timing. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so first question I have is, off of Romans 8, what does it mean to walk after the Spirit? What does that that part of the verse really mean to, to us? I think following the path that God has for us, not not simply going according to our own will and our own wishes, but following him. Mm -hmm. I agree. And why is that important? I mean, it outlines a couple of th reasons here why we should want to, why we should have that desire. That was from the first verse in Roman and the verses in Romans? Yes. Okay. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we don't have to follow um, our natural path to sin and death. Now we have freedom to choose to um, follow him. Because mm -hmm. before we couldn't. Mm -hmm. Before he, he gave us that freedom. I mean, and it also says that he, um, I just saw it. For God done with the law, we can flesh could not do. Okay, so God did what the law we can by flesh could not do. So the law couldn't do this. It couldn't save us. Only by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. Mm -hmm. He had to send his son in the sinful flesh to deal with what happened. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that in itself is a blessing and a, a desire, a reason we should desire to walk in the spirit. And so when you look at Ephesians, when we flip over to Ephesians 2, um, what is the good thing about living by grace and faith? It's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And it's not something we can brag about. It's something that was literally just handed to us. We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. I like that nine says it's verse nine, not the result of work so that no one may boast. Mm -hmm. There's no reason you can, there's no way you can say, oh, I did that. I got that. God gave that to me because I'm a, well, people do say they're his favorite, but they can't say I had to, you know, me and God have this, this thing going on. I gave him this and he gave me grace and faith. Like there's, there's nothing we could do to, to earn grace and faith. Yeah. And I like that um, in verse 10, it says that, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. So it's not that we're not supposed to do good works. We can't earn it, but he created us to do the good things. Mm -hmm. and I think that's important also to remember as we're talking about walking in the spirit, what that really means in our lives. Like how, how does that look? And how does that look? Especially in the end times. Mm -hmm. Keeping the commandments. Well, I mean, it's just like day-to-day -day life. So as you're going to work, as you're hanging with the kids, Lindsay, and meeting up with old friends, traveling, um, meeting with patients, how does walking in grace and faith, knowing that Christ died for our sins, um, seeing all the things that are going around. So I know when, Wednesday when the smoke was down, I told the kids, I was like, and I told my husband, I said, it looks like end times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's just so much happening. How do we exhibit that we believe that Christ died for us? We don't have to worry. I don't think we have to worry about the same things that the rest of the world has to worry about. Because mm -hmm. first of all, we know what the ending is going to be. And we know that he already sees it all. Um, that we can trust the way it is and that's not to say that i think bad things don't happen i know that there are terrible things unfair things that happen mm -hmm. to people in all kinds of situations and yet i can still know that he's there and he has the solutions mm -hmm. for our problems and he has the ability to heal whatever pain people um, go through um and that that is comfort to me. And I think to, to all of us, you know, in, in the various walks of life that we 
have had to endure. Mm -hmm. And I think knowing that, that he felt what we're feeling mm -hmm. and we don't even get half of the stuff that Jesus got because we don't put ourselves in this situation to get it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we, we hide behind our faith. We hide behind the pillar, I should say, and go, I'll just leave that. God will work on their heart. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But Jesus put himself out there and he was like, I know this is going to happen, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine living an entire, because you know, it says that he felt every, every pain, every type and level of, um, you know, of pain. And I, it's hard to imagine receiving all that within a 33 year lifespan. Yeah. Exactly. It's intense. Yes. And I feel like just me feeling my own emotions is mm -hmm. intense and feeling what I'm only going through is intense sometimes, but to feel what everyone at, all at once feels and goes through is just incredible incredible and you know when you're in the the spotlight you're already targeted so not only feeling that but then being targeted for everything you do mm -hmm. i mean when you look through the gospels jesus was targeted like there was social media mm -hmm. it's true and it took like months for news to travel and you would think it was instantaneous the way some of this stuff was happening yeah. yeah. You ever have those days where you feel like the whole world is against you and Satan's just laying all these traps for you? Like you were special. Well, really? <laughs> That's kind of exactly how it was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 100% for 33 years. Yeah. And without fear. Mm -hmm. He wasn't afraid, which is really cool as well. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, you know, from childhood, because I think as an adult, um, having had the experience from years past and seeing the world and seeing the way things work, I think I would say I'm in a better position to be able to understand and make better choices. But imagine from, from the time he was born, you know, um, he had to, you know, endure mm -hmm. temptation. And so let's look at that, the struggle towards the end of his life. Uh, let's read Matthew 27, 45 through 50. I have it. Okay. It says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So from this, we can see the agony that Jesus endured in those last moments on the cross. And I know we talked about how he felt the pain at this point, he felt the pain and the separation yeah. um, from his father, who he had been with this entire time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard. I mean, even when you see a child who has been with their mother for a year or two years and that separation anxiety they have yeah. in our human nature, you can only imagine what this would have felt like with that pain and having no buffer from that. Mm -hmm. um, but even in his last moments, he was faithful throughout. Knowing that this was going to happen, he still went through yes. all of this. Why is this connection important for us to understand as Christians? Why is it so eloquently laid out in the gospels so that we can read it and truly internalize what this means for us? I think it showed... That he, he couldn't rely, even 
even being God, he couldn't rely on his emotions, Mm -hmm. you know, because all of his feelings said, God is gone. He has left me. He is not there for me when I need him. Mm -hmm. That is a hundred percent the feelings he had because he had the whole, he had all this sin to, to, to block out, um, his view of the father. Mm -hmm. And, um, so he didn't see it. He had to simply have faith. He had to have exactly what we were talking about earlier, the faith of Jesus Christ. He had to have that faith to know that even something that he had been able to have being human, that connection with God, Mm -hmm. to trust that God was still going to see him through, even when he seemed completely gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so they, it talks about the faith of Jesus. That's something that we talked about in the last section where it says the end time Christians are the ones who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Mm-hmm. What type of faith did Jesus have? What does that mean? The faith of Jesus, especially mm-hmm. understanding this. Well, I like how the lesson says it's a faith so deep, so trusting, so committed that all the demons in the cosmos and all the trials on earth cannot shake it. It's a faith that trusts when it cannot see, believes when it cannot understand, hangs on when there is little to hang on to. And it's a gift that we receive by faith. Just like that. Yes. Because, you know, I think we know that faith is something that we can't see. But I think a lot of times people think that it's something they feel. Mm -hmm. And this is like a really stark reminder that the faith surpasses our sight and our feelings. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it literally is faith that withstands crisis when there's nothing else. There's there's no anything because a lot of times when you you're like oh I can't see it but you have a little inkling um you know we have faith that the sun will shine because we can see a little bit of crack through the clouds Mm -hmm. we have faith that spring is coming because a daffodil pops up through the snow Mm -hmm. but this is faith that when it's snowing in June that cold will not always last or when it's been snowing for, you know, eight years. Yeah. That it will not last forever. Mm-hmm. Literally when there's nothing else to hold on to, there's no reason why you should believe what you believe. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible. Like it cannot happen and you still believe that it will happen. And the people around you will let you know that it's completely unreasonable to believe. But you're, you're crazy. You're nuts. What do you want? What? No, there's no way that can happen. Um, so how do we build this type of faith? Mm, like we said, day by day, with every moment that God gives or allows us to go through, um, and every day focusing on him, yeah. Yeah. And I think giving over to him the things that are small in our lives, mm-hmm. it begins with the small things in our lives. Yeah. Then as we see how he works, we trust him with bigger things. And I think that requires us to give glory to him in those small things. Mm-hmm. Because if we just say, oh, yeah, that was just coincidence that that happened then that doesn't build our faith to be able to see how he's working and that he will continue to work. We'll think, oh, Mm -hmm. I guess I got lucky this time around, you know, Mm -hmm. next time around, we'll see what happens. And that's, um, so I think it's not that he doesn't want to do big things in our lives. Sometimes it's just that we don't, we don't recognize the work that he's already doing in our lives to be able to trust him with bigger things. And with the big things, not only trusting him, but trusting him when there's nothing else that can be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read Revelation 13, 15 through 17. 
Okay, five fifteen. Okay, it says, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast could even speak, and cause those who could who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Also, it causes all, both great, small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark that is, the name of the beast and the number of, of its name. So this is talking about an end time time, a time in the end, um, where the dragon has given power to this this beast to do these things it literally is a time where there's nothing else to hold on to mm -hmm. what does this say about god's chosen people who are god's chosen people and what will happen to the faithful during that that end time i think his his chosen people are going to be the minority mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And apparently they're going to be poor and hungry for a time. Mm -hmm. And persecuted. Mm -hmm. The death degree trying to kill God's people. Excluded from society. And I think something that, it, that stands out to me is the fact that this is uh, something that the people the people want. It's not just the government is enforcing it. It's something that the people want. And I mean, I don't want to make anything political, but I remember early on in the pandemic, because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why would your neighbors turn against you? Like my neighbors are always nice. They wave and they'll bring things, you know, on the holidays and stuff. Um, but then... I remember reading in the news how people were like turning it, you know, calling, calling the, the police on their neighbors for having gatherings more than six people or something. And then you start realizing, oh yeah, well, with the idea of the common good and for, you know, everyone else's health and benefit. Yeah, sure. They sure will. <laughs> oh, you're putting my, you're putting me at danger. I'm at yeah. risk because you're next to me and you have all these people and you're going to get it get it. And then I'm going to get it because I'm close to you. Cause I don't know how it spread. It could spread into my house and I never go outside, you know? Yeah. The, the, the mice might carry it from your house to mine. I mean, mm -hmm. but, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to get into the topic of COVID, but just when I saw that, I was like, Oh yeah, that's what, that's what we do. You know, with the mindset of for everyone's benefit, Mm -hmm. We all need to be in this together. Yes. And I think it's that same thing, you know, why wouldn't we want everyone's benefit? Why do you want to be so difficult in this? Why stubborn on this issue? It's not a big deal, you know, mm -hmm. whereas it is. Yes. And you look at that, even in the church where it's like, why wouldn't you want to do this good thing? Why are you pushing back against it? Because it's good for everyone. You do want Jesus to come back, right? You want to spread the gospel, right? And it's like, but that wasn't the way we were supposed to do this. That's not the, the way that you go about it. You know, it's the same type of concept. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it even says it causes all both great and small, rich and poor, free and slaved. So it's something that, We'll We're all working together. Yeah, and, we have, you. and we have so much division in the world. Mm -hmm. When you have something that brings everyone together, why would you, you not be a part of that? Yeah. We all want world peace, right? This is part of world peace. Yeah. Exactly. Faith when you literally have nothing else to hold on to. Yeah. yeah. I'm feeling bad, you know? <laughs> But I think this is important for us to realize so that when that time does come, we can stand yes. um, and go, oh, this is what those, this is what the prophecy was talking about because I am standing alone or my family is standing alone, or I can't even get to those who are like-minded because some of them aren't even like-minded anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's interesting to, to have that 
that um, comes to fruition. Mm -hmm. And you realize it and you go, oh, this is what it really means. Yeah, that's when what we have been building every day now will be what's most important for us then. We can really use it then. And that's when it's really going to help us through remembering what God has said in his scriptures, remembering his love for us, and that he will strengthen us. And he will provide for us during that time. So when you look at Galatians 6, 7 through 9, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for you reap what you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you reap eternal life from the spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing that verse so many times in different contexts, not mm -hmm. just this one. I've been hearing it a lot. <laughs> I actually put a Facebook post up because I read the, the lesson and then it was the verse of the day on my phone mm. like the next morning. And I'm going, okay, so this is something that I need to get because, you know, when things repeat, it's because we are supposed to, to get something out of it. Yeah. Um. So why is this an important reminder at the end times? Oh man, we're going to be tempted to be weary. We're going to be tempted to give up. We're going to be tempted to just give in to like what we were saying, just give in to being like everyone else. Mm -hmm. So we need this reminder to not give up. To yeah, not give up. it's a great reminder. Yeah. And if you do any gardening, yeah, there are times where you just look out and you're like, yeah, nothing's going well. Mm -hmm. It's just not happening fast enough. It's not going to be ready. Mm -hmm. No. Um, the reminder, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And his timing is not our timing. Yeah. And I like that it points out, um, do not grow weary of doing good. Yes. So like knowing that we're doing good, knowing that what you are doing is good. And I relate that to my job in um, helping clients, helping people and what they're going through and their struggles. Some sessions feel like, well, we didn't get anywhere this time. Um, <laughs> that was just a circle of things, but over a long period of continuing that person continuing to be willing to work and me com continuing to show up and prepare and work hard to help them in whatever way that they need in that way. I am reminded of not growing weary of doing good. Don't stay in that one session. See the progress that's going over time. Yeah. I think that's also a reminder of when there is nothing to hold on to, still do the right thing. Yes. Um, when you feel like you've said the same thing over and over again and you keep running into the same wall, still do it because at some point it's gonna click. Yeah. It's gonna make a difference. Even if we never see it, it's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. It saves it could be the difference between someone seeing Jesus when he comes back and not. Mm -hmm. Because we were consistent that little drip that erodes the rock. Yes. So let's look at those who follow the lamb. Uh, can someone read Revelations 13, one through two, actually one through three, and then someone else, Revelations 14 through 14, four through five. I have 13. Okay. Well, Revelations 13, one and two. And three. And three, okay. Um, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. 
and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Hmm. And then Revelation 14, four through five. Sure. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. All right, so what's the difference between those who follow the beast and those who follow the lamb? Well, I think the lamb definitely doesn't look as scary as this beast. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. They marveled and followed the beast. And I would say those who followed the lamb, um, there was no defilement. There was mm -hmm. no corruption um, in um, those, I guess those people, right? Or yeah. the lamb. <laughs> It says, in their mouth, no lie was found. They are blameless. And I think, you know, those that followed the beast, they were following him because of his power. You know, yeah. they were marveling, you know, who, who is like unto him? Look at him. Whereas those that followed the lamb, wherever he, he went, um, there, was, there was no deceit. I was also trying to figure out what the deadly wound that was healed is specifically referencing. If we could like touch on that for like a second, what was that deadly wound that was healed? If anyone knows, but if not, we can move on. <laughs> yeah, I'm. We didn't talk exactly about the who the beast was yet. Um, but towards the end of the lesson, it kind of identifies that beast as being um, the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. And so in history, there was um, a time where, you know, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church was really, it wasn't destroyed but it lost a lot of its power. You know, the king was was over um, the nation instead of the, the Pope the, and they started some other church and um, it didn't seem like, you know, the Roman Catholic church was really very much of a power anymore. Mm. Then, you know, as time went on, it seems like it's regained power and it has, has um, grown to be more of a worldwide church. Um, mm -hmm. Again. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I think an interesting part of this is at the end where it says, who is like the beast, who can fight against it? Um, it goes back to the verse in Galatians where it says, do not weary doing good. Mm -hmm. Because it's when we get to this, these hard times, it's easy to just say, I, there's nothing I can do. Why do I even fight? Mm -hmm. what, what's the point? Everybody else is, it's bigger than I am. Everybody else is doing it. I don't even know why I, I am doing what I'm doing anymore. Mm. So I think that's one of the, the big things to look at when it comes to, to those verses as well in the comparison. Mm -hmm. So in... Um, we stopped at three. Let's also read in 13. Let's continue with verses four and five. I can read that. Okay. Um, so they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So there's, as I mentioned, there's this perception that this beast cannot be overthrown. Um, 
and he's given this power. But it also talks about the Visa that was uttering haughty and blasphemous words, um, but was allowed to do this for a period of time. Mm -hmm. When we look at the end times, when we look at the, the, the life of Jesus, why is this important that we understand that this beast is throwing out the blasphemous words? I think it helps to identify who the beast is because mm -hmm. it's obviously not a literal animal, wild animal. It's a particular political power. So I think that's a very identifying characteristic that it's blasphemous, that it's declaring itself to be to be God or in the place of God. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of political powers. I mean, yeah, I mean, you have Nebuchadnezzar. He had said, you know, he he wanted to be worshipped, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there are a variety of kings that wanted to be worshipped in some point. Mm -hmm. um, but not so much, I think, anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's gone out of favor. We don't have, we haven't had any of our American presidents that have said, I'm God, worship me, you know? Right. Um, but historically yeah that was a big thing mm -hmm. it's narrowed down now not so many and i think uh, like at the end of the lessons it says hence antichrist also means in place of christ not really against christ mm -hmm. so talk about like the ultimate blasphemy mm -hmm. is that i am god type feel how does that compare to what we see in luke 5 and luke and john 10 let's read those really quickly um Luke 5, 18 through 26, and then John 10 through 10, 33. Okay. I should start at 17. Okay. Luke 5. Start 17 to 26. Okay. 17 to 26. Um, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the till tilling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. All right, and then John 10.33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. So what is the difference between the blasphemies of the beast that we see in Revelation 13 and then the blasphemy that Jesus was accused of in Luke and John? Well, in John, he is talking about this man making himself God. You know, he's saying he's God. And then the one that Naomi read 
was it in Matthew, he was saying Luke. Um, in Luke, he said that he could forgive sins, mm -hmm. which only God can do. Yes. So that was the, the great, um, the great blasphemy they referred to it as because man can't do that. They didn't understand that Jesus was God and that's why he could do it. And that's why it was not blasphemy. But if any one of us would, were to say that, it's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And how does Jesus stand in that place of that, in between us and God? And how is that the counterfeit? What's the counterfeit to that? He's the, he's the one mediator. He's the, there is one man, Jesus Christ, that stands as mediator between God and man, you know, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, no one comes to the father, but by me, he is the mediator. No one else is the mediator. Um, and even, you know, even with my kids, I, I try and explain as many things as I can to them about God. So like, there's a part of me trying to bring my children to a knowledge of God, but I, and even though I pray for them and I, I want them to have a relationship with God. I want them to bring their things to God for them to be forgiven. At the end of the day, I can't mediate. That's not, that's not my place. It's only, it's only Jesus Christ that can do that. And they need to come to him, um, not to me. Mm -hmm. And so there in the um, on Friday's lesson, there's a quote from, the Great Controversy, page 582, that says, the last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the longstanding controversy concerning the law of God. And so there's three main points for the end times that we really should be aware of that will keep us through, take us through that. It's to be alert what's happening in our world, be prepared and be active. How can we do each of these as we understand what this the the prophecy is saying as it's unfolding, what it means to um, what these blasphemies mean, what it means that these beasts are coming and what they're going to do and what's already happening as we see it happen. And when we start to understand or it's being revealed to us um, in our day to day, how can we be alert to what's happening, be prepared and then also be active? And this is our wrap-up question. I think it's important for us to read these verses mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to understand what they mean and also to share them with the people around us because um, as we read them again, we're reminded and we are also able to look for the things because honestly, for example, all of the popes have seemed very nice. They don't seem, I mean, within our lifetime, I know that there were some that did a lot of persecution, but I mean, they've, they, they're, they're gentle, kind, well-mannered old men. Um, and the Lord loves them and why wouldn't he? But the problem comes down to when we read this and we realize that we are still, they are still just men. Mm -hmm. They're created in the image of God, but their place in, in his plan is the same as for us. Mm -hmm. They need to come to Christ and they need to um, humble themselves before him and that they can't, they can't forgive our sins. They can't bring us closer to God in that way. That that's just Christ. We and we need to build our relationship with Christ because honestly, there's no there's no value in knowing this if we don't go home and make Christ our number one. Very very true. Do you have anything on that, Naomi? Um, I thought of 
um, being alert as in like what Lindsay said about knowing the scriptures, knowing what they mean, being prepared, going back to what we were saying about every day, giving our worries, our cares, our fears um, to God and um, doing our daily just worship and focusing on God and um, all of those things. And then active, I thought of when we're faced with those fears to use the scriptures, to be active in giving those things to God. Um, I may have sounded like it's the same thing, but preparing when we're not facing those fears or um, temptations or anything like that. And then when they actually come, be active in using the word and using what you have learned. And I got there somehow. There we go. <laughs> I think it is also, it is very much so using what, because you can be prepared all you want. So you can learn all the things and then never use it in your day-to-day -day life. Exactly. And at that point it's, it's fruitless. Mm -hmm. So very good, good wrap up there. Thank you both for um, participating today. Thank you all for joining us as we, as we went through the first part of A Seal of God and Mark of the Beast, we will now ask Sister Lindsay to close us out in prayer. Sure. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had to read and to learn of you. And Lord, we ask that um, those that are listening also have an opportunity to come to you, Lord. We thank you that we have the honor and privilege to come to you. Lord, we ask that you give us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind and not a fear lord um, because we can trust that you have things that are under control lord we also ask that you help us to not become too proud to um, come to you with all the things that we have in our hearts and our minds and um, that we might be an encouragement to those that are around us and we thank you for hearing our prayer in your name amen Amen. Thank you so much. And thank you all again. We hope you have a wonderful Sabbath and join us back next week for part two of this lesson. See you later. Have a great Sabbath. Good night.